Hello and welcome to Conversations with Ex-Catholics this time. I've been doing a lot of Conversations with Catholics, so I'm excited about this one. Today I am joined by Chad. What's up, Chad? Hey, what's up? Uh, I'm really excited to have you here. Um, like I just said, I've been doing a bunch of Conversations with Catholics, which which I love. I love talking to um, all of my all of my Catholic friends. Oh, and that's you. Um, <laughs> but... Um, but it's it's nice every now and then to to mix it up, um, and I understand that you have quite the story. You could say that, yeah, I guess so. Um, yeah, I've been, I was raised evangelical. I became Catholic for about nine years, and then just kind of lost my faith about seven years ago. Man, yeah, so, a little bit of everything. <laughs> yeah, you covered all of your bases. <laughs> um, well, okay, so I guess. I'm interested to, I guess, you know, this stuff that me and my audience are going to be the most excited about are probably what, mm -hmm. what drew you to Catholicism in the first place and then yeah. what brought you out of it. But I, I think a better place for us to start is probably going to be how did you grow up and all that? Like, Birth. Um, yeah, yeah. So start <laughs> us, you know, from Protestant to Catholic to, to yeah. nothing. Let's start with the Protestant. Um, yeah, let's start there. Yeah. So tell, tell me about uh, your... I was. Go ahead. I was raised a very evangelical Christian. My dad is a, he still is a pastor of a small uh, non-denominational church. Um, and uh, I, uh, you know, kind of accepted that as truth and accepted Jesus into my heart at a young age. I don't even remember how old I was, but, um, you know, probably eight or nine or something like that, got baptized soon thereafter. So in my tradition, we didn't baptize babies. We waited until you were, you know, middle school type age. Um, and uh, uh, this church was uh, non-denominational, but it had influences of something called Plymouth Brethren, which has some um, interesting distinctives. Um, one of the things is that they have like weekly communion, which is like a main part of their service. A lot of churches do communion maybe, you know, once a month or something like that. Um, but they really focus on communion. They use like, uh, they use bread or unleavened bread and then usually grape juice for their <laughs> communion. Um, but, and also it's like kind of an open service where anyone can stand up and share or something. And so from a young age, I remember my, my mom, especially like encouraging me to share something about, what God was doing in my life and something like that. So, uh, yeah, so I was raised in that. Um, some of the touchstones were like, uh, you know, we had a wana. I don't know if people have heard of a wana. It's what like a kid's that? club. Yeah, yeah. It's like a kid's club. That's kind of like boy scouts, but you meet once a week at the church and you play games and you memorize lots of Bible verses. So, okay. I we was in like that. a youth group as a kid. What, do you think it's like similar to a youth group or is it? Yeah, but it's like for younger time. kids. So okay. it goes all the way from like kindergarten through kind of high school. Oh, okay. And then, yeah. So I was, uh, once I was in high school, I was like an, a leader in Iwana. So I helped out with the kids and stuff like that. So what is that word? Iwana? Iwana. Like, yeah. It, it stands for or approved or workmen are okay. not ashamed from second Timothy or something. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I figured it had to, to mean something. Um, but okay. But yeah. So you were, you were, you were in it. Like you were Protestant. Yeah. For so real. I was in it. And then once I turned 13, I like started learning guitar and played in the worship band. Um, and my, my parents were both musical. Um, and yeah, I was, uh, you know, went to Bible camp every summer, um, where I was, I was like the cool kid at Bible camp, you know, in public school, I was not cool, but at Bible <laughs> camp, I was cool. I can relate. Um, yeah. Um, what else? You know, we had a lot of the evangelical stuff. Um, we had like, see you at the pole at school where you meet early in the morning and pray at the flagpole. That was, that was like a yearly thing. We had prayer breakfasts and Bible studies, and um, um, my parents like hosted all my friends in our house during high school for a Bible study. Wow! And so I would invite friends over, and I there was this one girl I was interested in, and she she would come to the Bible study, but 
she wasn't like really a Christian, you know, she said she was a Christian, but she didn't know how to look up verses in the Bible. And it was kind of embarrassing. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I look back now and cringe, but anyway, I was very, I was very dedicated to it. What kind of school were you attending as a kid? Was it a Christian school or was it a public yeah, school? Yeah, so I went to private school through eighth grade okay. and then public school and high school. And the private school was a Christian school? Mm hmm Yeah. Okay, okay. And yeah. then were you living in a particular— Young Earth Creation. Oh. Uh, Bob Jones University Press. Oh. Um, All right. Yeah. Um, and was this in a mostly like uh, religious kind of part of the country? Like you didn't grow up in like secular Boston, for instance. You grew no, up no. In, this yeah. was this was yeah Midwest Bible Belt. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, that sounds a lot like the Protestant version of my upbringing, where it's kind of like your whole life revolves around the church, right? Like, is that how you would yeah. describe your your upbringing? Like your whole life revolves oh, yeah. around? Yeah. Yeah. We were there all the time. Um, I didn't question it for a while. Um, I was, uh, I wasn't like a rebellious pastor's kid or anything, even in high school and college. Um, so, um, I mean like the closest thing rebellion to rebellion that I had was like, I also liked secular music, which my parents were pretty much okay with as long as it didn't get too crazy. But, um, yeah, I would, I would ride that line. Um, but I never drank or partied or did any of that stuff. We sound super, super similar <laughs> because I was also into secular music, but I think that my parents were mostly fine with it because the secular music that I was really interested in was not the secular music that everyone else was interested in. Yeah. I was yeah. listening to the Beatles and Led Zeppelin yeah. and Pink Floyd. And most, most of my music came from like the mid to late sixties and, and then the, the seventies for the most part. Um, yeah. And so no, like, even though it was secular music, it was so far removed from like the modernist culture that I think, I think that my parents were mostly okay with it. What were you listening to as a kid? Um, around 13, I started really getting into this band Kings X. I don't know if you've heard of them, but they're kind of this, no. uh, grunge kind of post metal art rock, a little bit of progressive band. Um, they were like semi-christian kind of former christians uh kind of like u2 kind of style but like heavier guitars and stuff so i got super into them and they've been my favorite band for like 30 years so i've seen them like Ooh. half a dozen times and that, yeah yeah now are, how, how christian are we talking like a skillet or are we talking like no not that they were like okay. like half of their albums were maybe in a christian music store but the other half weren't okay and uh yeah so and when i was in high school like the lead singer came out as gay and that was like a big <gasps> controversy oh, no. and, yeah um if you don't mind me interrupting for just <laughs> one second um yeah my friend daniel is interested in like what years we're talking about and he might want to know because of the secular music and also my friend gloff is making fun of me for liking my boomer rock i listen i like my dad rock okay leave me alone i um, love <laughs> 70s pro so I love like those first few Yes albums. Um, I love uh, what else do I? I like Twenty One Twelve by Rush. I like love some Rush. I like uh, what did I listen to back in high school? Oh, a lot of uh, the Who, Tommy. That album ruled. Nice. Um, and then I got into like any guitar virtuoso stuff. I was into like Joe Satriani and dude. I've, I've, I've seen some of your shredding videos. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've met Steve Vai. Steve Vai is like my my idol. Um, uh, and I don't know if you're into Porcupine Tree, but um, oh yeah, I love them. Yeah, I've too. seen them and, like two or three times. Um, that's Steve Wilson, right? Is in Porcupine Tree because yeah. I, I don't don't hurt me. Um, I think that I actually <laughs> like Steve Wilson's solo stuff more than Porcupine Tree. Um, Especially Hand Cannot Erase. That's Hand a Cannot great Erase album. is free. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> um, and then. Uh, uh, what's the Raven album? Like the Raven who refused to uh, sing? Yeah, is the that, Raven um, that refused to sing. Yeah, with yeah. Asylum and Drive Home. Man, that... <laughs> Daniel says we can all be friends. <laughs> good, good. I'm glad, yeah. I'm glad. Um, and, and Jason says that uh, his taste is more Lady Gaga and Rihanna, which, hey, I, <laughs> I almost met Lady Gaga one time. She visited her grandma at the retirement home that I worked at, and I was not working that day. So I almost met Lady Gaga. That's that's my Lady Gaga story. I'm sorry. Nice. 
no. we're we're pretty um far off the we're beaten good. path now on our this music. This is talk, yeah. So. This is gonna hopefully we get really nerdy into Catholicism and really nerdy into music because it's my kind of stream. Music is um music and the arts in general were a big part of like why I got interested in Catholicism to begin with. Because when I was in high school, uh, my two best friends and I were in a band and, um, you know, we were very Christian, but at the same time I was listening to the secular music and, um, I didn't want to be like a Christian band, you know, um, I wanted to just like write the best music we could and be a good rock band. And, um, but we kept getting like these gigs at like church basements and stuff and, <laughs> And uh, the other two guys in my band were a little more charismatic than I was and a little more like, we should. So I'd write a song and then be like, we need to add a part about Jesus or something. So I would be like, all right, let's write a third verse and we'll make a song about Jesus. And then uh, we would do these shows in a basement of like the, a Methodist church. And she'd be like, uh, the, the lady running the, the youth group or whatever would be like, so what do you guys got planned for ministry, you know? And I'd be like, okay, uh, we'll come up with something. So <laughs> I would work out these set lists where we'd play some songs and then we'd share our testimony and then we'd play some more songs. But at the same time, I was like, I don't, I don't like this. I want to be just like, just focus on making good art and not trying to, uh, of course I'm like 15 at the time. <laughs> it's kind of preposterous, but well when when we're our most true artistic selves right 15 <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly but um i was still interested in like you know trying to be more sophisticated about music and art than kind of the evangelical ethos was around me which was very much more the skillet type thing like your music is there for ministry and getting people saved. And um, it's not, it doesn't really matter what the lyrics are as long as they, you know, the make a difference in people's a means lives. to yeah. an end rather than like, yeah, an end exactly. Of itself. Yeah. And um, so the, the bands I was listening to were kind of writing that Christian line. Some of them were former Christians, some of them were Christians, but they wanted to, make good music and they didn't care about the Christian thing. So I was like very into that. Um, and I was, I, I felt like evangelicals view of the arts was pretty surface level. Um, and so I started reading some books about that. Um, there's a, there's a, um, philosopher that's big in evangelical circles called Francis Schaefer. And, um, he wrote some good books about it. And then his son ended up like his name's Frankie Schaefer. He also wrote books about it. A big one was called addicted to mediocrity. Um, someone wanted some dates. Uh, so this was like late nineties. Um, I went to high school in the late nineties. So that's kind of what we're talking about here. Um, and, uh, so yeah, he wrote this book called addicted to Me mediocrity, which was just about, what I've been talking about, just kind of how evangelicals have kind of this surface level view of the arts. And uh, this guy, Frankie Schaefer, ended up becoming orthodox. I don't know if he's practicing anymore. Anyway, he's like 50 or 60 or something now. But anyway, um, I read his books and, and similar ones to it. And just that kind of crack opening um, got me more interested in like, a little bit more interested in liturgy and the arts. And I started thinking in college, like, oh, maybe someday I might want to become Anglican. Um, so that, that's, that, that was the first door that opened, I would say, to becoming Catholic was just kind of the arts and thinking about that. And I, I guess when you were um, like, like 18 or whatever, were mm -hmm. you thinking like, was your perception that the Catholic church was just going to be a lot uh, like just at least Catholics are going to have a more sophisticated understanding of the arts than I don't even know if Catholicism was a live option for years, you know, like, okay. Yeah. But maybe I, high church I, Anglicanism? hard for me to remember, but um, I knew um, 
I knew like one guy in one band that was Catholic and I was like, whoa, that's crazy. You know, um, <laughs> we're Catholics Christians. I probably would have said probably not, you know? Ooh, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You know, maybe if they had a personal relationship with Jesus, they were Christians. I okay. would have said, you know, all right. Some of them are, but yeah, they're, I didn't, they're I didn't think of it as like <laughs> just one possible Christian denomination, you know? Yeah. Um, it wouldn't be until much later that I considered it a live option. So probably later in college. Um, I was, but I was, uh, I was very interested in like other denominations and stuff too. So I remember I had my, my dad had like a handbook of denominations. It was like a, I don't remember who wrote it, but I would just like read that as just like fun reading. And, uh, I was very into, uh, you know, personal Bible reading was very, um, encouraged in my tradition um i can tell you didn't and, grow up catholic sorry <laughs> yeah sorry. i know and so i tried to do a lot of that um i also got like a study bible when i was 13 and i was very into that and i would like i think i enjoyed like the study notes more than the actual bible reading <laughs> because like even now if i try to read the bible like i'll read a couple verses and i just have so many questions or so many things i want to dig into I can't just read it for an hour. Um, I never could really. Um, so I think my first study Bible was a Ryrie study Bible. And he's like um, one of the big, big names behind dispensationalism, if you've heard of that theological movement. But yeah, so I've definitely heard it, but I don't remember yeah. what it what it entails it tries to like break up salvation history into these different dispensations where god kind of works it's kind of like covenants you know like okay. god had to covenant and different set of rules at different times and uh i'm not an expert in it but um yeah me neither you you would get some interesting things like uh you know like stuff in the gospels where jesus is telling people it seems like jesus is saying do good works well, he's in a dif different dispensation, so we don't actually have to do that anymore, you oh. know, because now we just trust in Christ. Anyway. See, it seems um, convenient. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so I was, I was into, uh, you know, learning about different denominations, and um, uh, where was I going with that? I don't know. But Catholicism wasn't a live option until probably college, where I ran across in my college library, um, secular college, um, like kind of the free book box, you know, they were just like giving it away. Uh, there was Surprised by Truth, uh, which is a collection of like conversion stories to Catholicism. I think I think Jimmy Akins might be in there. Um, uh. Some of the... Uh, you know, Tim Staples might be in there. I'm not sure. There's yeah. the Catholic Answers kind of crowd. Yeah, it's yeah. One of the early Catholic Answers guys. Like um, pre Trent Horn Catholic Answers. Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Most of my time is pre Trent Horn, I think. I don't know when he came on the scene, but. A while um, ago now, but was it, was it 10 years ago? Was, was Trent with Catholic Answers? I'm not sure. Yeah. Maybe because I think I became Catholic in 2005. Okay. So, um, finding that book in college, I remember reading that and just being like blown away, like, oh my gosh, this could be true. And that lit a fire under me. I look back on it now and I think it, it may have like really damaged my faith because just the fact that it like i feel like it almost destroyed just like the basis of my authority you know just like sola scriptura mm. and it just like demolished that and uh so i was desperate to like find out if it was true and i pretty much just like bought every catholic apologetics book i could read um for the i don't know it was at least a couple years i think um started listening to every podcast i could find reading blogs all day and all night 
Um, so this was in the early 2000s when blogs were very big. <laughs> and I started my own blog called Chad is Not Enough. And uh, <laughs> that was a joke title based on this book by Thomas Howard called Evangelical is Not Enough. Um, and he's he was one of my favorite writers at the time. He's like brother to Elizabeth Elliot. If you know your evangelical, um, if you know your evangelical uh, celebrities, she's a big one. Okay, um, I, don't, I don't know my evangelical <laughs> celebrities. I was uh... yeah. He was her brother. She was like a famous missionary wife, basically. Thomas Howard was her brother. He wrote this book called Evangelical Is Not Enough. And he basically talks about the arts. He talks about liturgy. He talks about prayer. Um, he makes the case that he kind of like helps evangelicals see that all these things are are good and that they're better than just the plain old evangelical things. So, um, you know, he says extemporary prayer is great. That's that's cool. But also, why would you not? Just as just as you sing a song that someone else has written, why wouldn't you say a prayer that someone else has written? Of course, this is like second nature to cradle Catholics, right? But of course, um, we love our to evangelicals. It's like, why would you recite a prayer? That's so you know, it's it's your heart's not in it, you know. Yep. And I, I know that uh, a, a lot of evangelicals make a big deal about the vain repetitions too, right? That's right. That, yeah. Right. But Catholics love our vain repetitions, you know. We don't. <laughs> we don't care. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, and. So that book, he, um, that book, Evangelical is Not Enough, basically, I don't remember how he ends it, but it kind of, he makes the case for Anglicanism or some kind of higher church, but it was known that he eventually became Catholic. Ah, okay. So that book helped me a lot. And um, I think I still, I think I still have all my Thomas Howard books. He, he's actually like a really good writer. Um, a lot of my other apologetics books, I... I I donated to half price books, but um, did you did you read any like um like Scott Hahn? I'm trying to think about. Like, I read almost every Scott Hahn. Okay. Um, I read like uh, I remember really liking Mark Shea's stuff. Um, I don't know if he's still in the business at all, but uh, I don't know if I know him. I watched every debate that I could find, so all the old uh, all the old James White debates oh yeah the jerry mattatix debates the uh was this tim also... staples debates uh and patrick um patrick uh, madrid patrick madrid yeah. that's his name yes he was big back then too mm -hmm. yeah I'm, I'm like reaching back to like my childhood because i'm i was i was <laughs> born in 95 just okay for the like you know 81 um, here yeah okay okay <laughs> so but but i remember this stuff because like i i yeah. listened to like cassettes of like Scott Hahn's yeah. books, not on, you know, I, I would have been young, but like my dad was listening to them and I was just kind of like in the room, while, you know, you know, while they yeah. were on and stuff like that. So that's why I'm familiar. Yeah, so with I would like stuff. collect all these MP3s of all these old talks and stuff. Um, some of them were old, some of them were new. Um, a lot of people were doing podcasts back then. I don't remember specific names off the top of my head, but um, even me. And then there was like this whole blog community of lots of people that were converting um, which I assume they're still out there because people are always converting and deconverting. Um, but, you know, similar people with similar backgrounds as I, and we were all like sharing links back and forth. And um, yeah, Catholic Answers was huge. So I would listen to their radio show and their podcasts and listen to EWTN radio. I listened to like every, uh, um, what's his name? Who's the guy that fell from grace? Uh Crappy, every crappy message ever. I listened to all those. Father John Crappy. I don't know if I remember. You him. haven't heard of him? I don't oh think so. God. Someone needs to make a um, a documentary about this guy. He is ridiculous. He was like the biggest Catholic speaker ever, and turns out he had like a second life. And I don't want to get sued or anything, but <laughs> um, how do you spell his last name? <laughs> C O R A P I A P I For whatever reason when you google him the first picture that comes up is President Joe Biden. I don't know why, <laughs> but I also found a Wikipedia article formerly known as Father John Carapi. 
Yeah, he got laicized or something. Interesting. Okay, well, I know the topic of my next video essay then, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, I think, like, Ratzinger was my main. I think he was, like, the Pope the entire time I was Catholic almost. Um, and I really liked him a lot. Um, Pope Benedict. Yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Because yeah, he, he was um, elected in 2006 or whatever, right? Like, yeah. yeah. And I went to I went to New York when he visited and got to see him on the street and then also in the arena or wherever it was. And I went just to go just to go to that. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um I don't know. Did I jump too I think I jumped too fast right into so, Catholicism. I guess yeah. maybe what I'm interested in is like so you read all these books, but do you remember yeah. the arguments that like kind of did you in? So mm. um what you did talk about so far was that like it just really seemed like Catholics kind of had like a better appreciation for the arts. Um yeah. but do you remember if there was anything else? Yeah, I mean, I thought the arguments against sola scripture were really strong. I thought the arguments um against sola fide were really strong and i was very into just like theological issues so like i said you know i would listen to every debate and chase down every theory that i could find online anyway um and i just thought they were stronger on especially those cases and um everything else was like once once i got those two things kind of locked in it was like everything else if they have a decent answer for i'll believe it you know so it was okay. like um all right well you know maybe the assumption doesn't have that many historical references to it uh maybe our evidence for the mary's assumption isn't that strong but you know it's obviously the church and i'm going to radically accept it and uh, submit myself to her yeah um my people in my life have given me that same exact argument like to this day um yeah like like well kevin you should still be catholic because really like look at all the stuff that they got right why don't you just trust them on the rest kind of um yeah so and i, I get yeah. the attitude i do like you know it's especially if you grew up in it like like i did it and like my whole family did really um but that's interesting that you kind of wound up feeling the same way too even at, yeah even not as a cradle catholic yeah and i had to like I would read a book about it, you know, I would like research it a little bit en enough to kind of calm my fears. Um, but I had like, I, f I was like, once I decided to become Catholic, I was ready, you know, like I felt like I had read all the books I needed to. And, um, I went to RCIA for a little while, but I felt like I could teach it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, then I, I, I dropped out of RCIA for some reason, and then ended up going to a kind of a, a uh, traditional-ish Nor Novus Ordo place, okay. parish, and um, I, I just met with the priest for like I don't know a couple months, and um, then he received me into the church along with another couple that was kind of in a similar place as I was. Um, and and you, that was. Can you tell yeah. me what traditional-ish Novus Ordo is? Yeah, means? yeah. Um, it's hard for me to remember because it's like seven years ago now. But uh, basically, the ordinary was in Latin. Oh, okay. Um, they did like traditional chants. They had a really good choir. I joined the choir for a while. It was awesome. Um, that's. I mean, that's they just tried to be very formal. Um, you know, everyone wore, most people wore like suits and stuff. Um, I mean, what else would be? That sounds like one of those unicorn Novus Ordo masses that people yeah, talk about. Yeah, it was like, know? it was kind of like known as like the, the reverent one in town, you know. There was a few that were known for that, but that was like, it was a destination parish for sure. Okay. You know, in a, in a city, right? Um, and, uh, what was I going to say? Um, you were, I don't talk, know. Go ahead. You, yeah. yeah. I mean, I can kind of like ask some questions. So yeah. you wound up um, going from evangelical to Catholic and you quickly found yourself in a 
trad adjacent Novus Ordo parish. How yeah. how um And I was Anglican for maybe a year in between, but oh, I never it, okay. it was not like formal. But yeah, I did go to an Anglican church for a while, kind of while I was reading all these apologetics. It was your stepping stone. Yeah, yeah. Your, your, your I got to give him a little credit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> but uh, how how uh so did you stay at that church for your entire Catholic career? Or in and out, yeah. Okay, okay. And um, was that so the Tradist would, church too? That I would hop around, um, especially later on. I uh, I would hop around more, just depending on when I woke up that day. Or um, I ended up moving a little bit further away from that parish, and I would go to a different parish. But I would usually try to find the more traditional ones. Um, I went to Latin masses a few times here and there. I never became a Latin mass true believer okay. um, or a full on traditionalist. I always felt like um, I liked certain parts of the mass in English. I liked certain parts of the Novus Ordo, Ordo better. Um, I liked, I kind of liked the half and half, a little bit of the ordinary in Latin, a little bit of the English. Um, I liked knowing what was going on and when things were happening. And I felt like in the Latin mass, I just like, okay the bell's ringing now i think something's happening you know it's just like <laughs> flip a few pages ahead to be like oh well, yeah I, hear the bell. I wanted to actively engage in what was being said um and uh oh yeah father z's blog i was really big into that he was big and did you know him i don't all? think so father zulsdorf he was very this is yeah i guess this is blogs are not a thing anymore i don't know <laughs> not but. as much they're all on youtube now <laughs> Um, he was very traditional and I even, I went to some kind of meeting where I met him and, um, it was weird. Anytime I met like the very traditional priests or I always felt awkward. I think, I think you, one of your, your videos or something talked about that. Just like the rarefied air among traditional priests. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. And, yeah. and you know what it did to me too, is it made me feel awkward around Nova Zordo priests because they were so informal. I like, didn't mm. like imagine that like the president of the United States, like walked into your house and like, just like took off his shoes and was like, Hey, like I'm just gonna like hang out and like drink a beer. You would probably be like, I don't like, I would feel more comfortable if you were wearing like a suit and you said like, you know, you can call me Mr. President, right? Like you expect somebody to, um, like have a certain air of authority about them. And then I would meet a Nova Sorta priest and they didn't have that air of authority about them. And I would like, didn't know what to do. It was really weird. <laughs> so I like, and Oh, and I still, to this day, I feel weird referring to priests by father first name. Like the, like father oh, yeah. Casey has like a big, like he breaking the habit. Um, I, calling him father Casey is weird, but mm -hmm. I don't know his last name. So I can't refer to him as anything. <laughs> And like, I feel like people call Bishop Barron though, Bishop Barron. So that one's, that one's at least, you know, nice and straightforward, but yeah, it's, it's a very trad thing to refer to priests only by their last name. And that's what I do for the most part when I can. So I remember when ways. he was just starting, he was just father Barron, I think, or something. I guess he was always father last name and Bishop last name though. Did anybody ever just refer to father, him as father Robert? Yeah. I don't, I don't know. So. Father Robert Barron. Because I remember reading his, or you know, seeing his early content online before he became bishop, I think. But anyway, I remember before yeah. I remember him before he was a bishop. But yeah, I think I always ever hear people referring to him either by first line, first name, last name, or just last name. Um, like nobody ever, like if somebody said like Father Robert, I'd be like who? Or Bishop Robert, I'd be like <laughs> which bishop is that? You know? He's, yeah. Robert Barron, but I don't know. Maybe that's just me. Um, yeah. And damn it. Now I know Father Cole's last name. So now I'm going to have to call him <laughs> Father Cole. And nobody's going to know who I'm talking about. Father Casey Cole. There we go. That does help, kind of. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. But okay. Um, so we also say, we also said the Chaplet of Divine, Divine Mercy after Mass, I believe. Okay. Um, and. What's the, uh, I think that's the one. Yeah. It that's, was like a shrine to the Divine Mercy, the parish that I went that's to. That's Sister Faustina and all that stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that, and that's uh, there was a lot of Opus Dei folks there. Um, I remember 
talking to one parishioner and, you know, I was confiding in him about my wife not being Catholic. And he told me I should put a rock in my shoe to remind me to pray for her. Really? I never did that. Yeah. That's a little much. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so I'm interested to hear a little bit more about... Um, so you you uh, you became Catholic. You got received in through mm-hmm. you know kind of the alternate route instead of through um, yeah. like the normal kind of convert route. Um, and you remained Catholic for a certain number of years. But then anybody who's read the thumbnail mm-hmm. knows that it didn't it didn't stick. I'm interested to hear, I guess, h- how long it took for things to start not making sense again. Um, yeah. And then also like what was the first thing I guess to 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 make you question. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I can remember the first thing. Um, I, I know, so definitely becoming Catholic was kind of traumatic for my faith. Like I talked about just like, because it was, even though they presented it as a fulfillment of my previous faith, I felt like it was definitely a rebuilding in a new image of my previous faith. Um, So that mixed with just kind of a radical submission to the church um, meant that I didn't know what I believed anymore, but I was going to submit to the church. Um, And that's kind of a weird place to be. And um, a few of the early things that, that started to change my mind, I remember and this is maybe one of the differences between like traditional Catholicism and a little more conservative Catholicism was I started to really get into science and evolution. And, um, I felt like as a Catholic, I could possibly figure out whether we evolved or not and whether we have common ancestry with other animals. Um, I never felt that freedom as, as an evangelical because I was, very steeped in like young earth creationism. So I read, um, finding Darwin's God by Kenneth Miller. I read, um, the DNA book by the guy, uh, I forget his name, uh, language of God by Francis Collins. Um, I read the creationist by Ron numbers, which is kind of a historical work. And, uh, the, the first book that you mentioned from the guy from the, 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 the trials or whatever he's christian or he's catholic isn't he yeah he is yeah, yeah. kenneth miller yeah kenneth miller thank you so like that's yeah. that was a safe a safe book to read yeah. in the sense that like you know he's sure he's he's he was on the pro-evolution side of the of that trial but but he was catholic yep okay exactly and yeah so it wasn't like it wasn't actively harming my faith at the time to embrace evolution mm-hmm. but i think it was opening the door to um a little more open-minded research, um, fact finding. Um, and then just kind of, uh, I don't know what the term is. I don't know if it's like natural theology or just kind of like, um, seeing things as they are. And I felt like Catholicism gave me the freedom to, to see things as they were. So if, um, if uh, if humans evolved and that's what science says, then you can accept it as long as you don't deny any other dogmas. Um, cool. Uh, awesome. But just like opening up that part of my brain meant that I could also say, well, if the church evolved or if theology evolved or if morality evolved um, or if the Bible evolved or if sacred tradition evolved, uh, then I can acknowledge that too. Um, and... Uh, so, and this took place over years, but, you know, I was then able to like read Bart Ehrman and read, you know, stuff like that. So more critical, like scholarship. Um, I remember, um, there was, um, an article by judge John Noonan, I think that basically looked at five different moral issues and how the church has evolved on like usury, slavery, extra ecclesium nullus sanctus or whatever it's called salus e. yeah yeah mm-hmm. uh, salus yeah um and some other topics basically made the case that the church had evolved on these moral issues and i 
I, that sent me into total tailspin. And of course there was apologetic responses to all those things too. So I probably spent days reading back and forth on all these different issues. Um, of course now I'm like, of course it evolved. Um, right. But yeah. Um, I just, that was part of it. It's just like, uh, I thought I became Catholic in order to have this real strict kind of foundation. This is absolutely what you should believe. And uh, you don't have to worry about it. You just trust the magisterium. And turns out magisterium is just as messy as any other thing out there, you know? I sometimes refer to like infallibility like a shell game. And I do think it's weird. There's like this false advertising thing going on with the Catholic Church where like, Oh, like you know, you'll hear it in a lot of conversion stories to Catholicism, yeah. where it's like, like, oh, what what attracted you to Catholicism? Oh, the certainty, right? The black and white yeah. nature of everything. But then, like, the more that you dig into it, you realize that, like, even the church itself will say things like, you know, like, sure, we didn't change the teaching, but we developed it significantly. And you're like, ah. so I just did a, a big like a, like a research video on cremation and like. I remember being a kid and being told, like, absolutely not. Cremation is not an option for any Catholics. And um, a while ago, they changed so that you can't be cremated. I didn't even realize this. Literally in December, like as in four, four months ago or whatever, they changed it again so that previously you could be cremated, but all of your ashes had to remain together. Like, you couldn't separate the ashes. So no sprinkling the ashes. Also, no dividing up the ashes so that each kid, like if there's four kids, you each get a quarter of the ashes. That was not allowed either. Now that's allowed as of literally December. And it's like, okay. Yeah. So I think one of the things was kind of just the evolution of everything. So there's evolution of humans and then evolution of religion. Mm -hmm. um, that was one of the big things. Um, I remember Pope Francis actually being kind of a big thing, even though I wasn't, I wasn't traditionalist, but I definitely kind of leaned more conservative and, I really liked Pope Benedict, and I just remember Pope Francis just being disappointing to me, like just the way he held himself and the way he questioned things. And, uh, you know, I, it's hard for me to remember specifics, but like just so informal and a lot of the reasons like people now would praise him, you know, or more leftist people would love him. It just like turned me off. Um I remember like his Wednesday, one of his early Wednesday audiences, you know, instead of his blessing, he was like, have a good lunch. <laughs> Just remember being like, what the heck? I converted for this for have a good lunch. That, oh, is, that is really weird. Um, and yeah. I'm trying to think, I don't think Francis played a role for me at all. Not because we approved of Francis. We did not. But we just yeah. ignored Francis so thoroughly that, like, yeah. I don't think that Pope Francis played any role at all in my, like, ultimate leaving of the Catholic Church. Um, so when you say that Pope Francis did besides, like, the kind of, like, ha like the have a good lunch, <laughs> like, just the seeming, like, un... Um, I don't know what the word he just felt. For. He just felt like the flaky 70s priests that mm. I had come across, you know um when i would visit other parishes and stuff um you, just like yeah just wasn't my kind of catholicism it just didn't interest me you know yeah yeah <laughs> i'm so i'm so sorry to pull this up because this has nothing to do with what we were talking about but <laughs> oh yeah 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 we should talk about all that okay. stuff because um uh yeah so this whole time uh, I've totally left my wife out of the picture. Um, so I was married uh, before I was Catholic, while I was Catholic, and I'm still married to the same person. And uh, so uh, she has always been evangelical Protestant of kind of a reformed variety um, and never really interested in Catholicism, even though I prayed for it every day and tried to get her to read books. Um I remember like one Lent, I tried to make some kind of deal with her. Like I'll do the dishes every night. If you just read Rome, sweet home or something like that. <laughs> um, and, uh, I think she threw the book across. The room. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh. Um, but yeah, she, 
she would uh, she would go with me to mass because um, I would take take the kids and her, um, but she never was really interested in changing her mind or considering it, as far as I know. Um, and then uh, I had basically had five kids during the time I was Catholic. I think the first one was like right before I became Catholic. Um, so we were definitely open to life. Um, and then as soon as I <laughs> jump ahead, as soon as I left the church and like skipped mass and everything, uh, I was like, I'm getting, <laughs> I'm getting cut. Nice. <laughs> Yeah, that was like that was my first sin. So if they say you lose your faith in order to sin, that was it. So that's what did you in was you just really wanted a vasectomy really bad. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But uh, let's see. So at the time, I mean, we wanted kids, and um, so it wasn't like a big deal um, or some big sacrifice. You know, I think we would have had a lot of kids regardless. Maybe not five, maybe two or three, but yeah. Um, we're thankful for them now. Um, but yeah, I was, I think it definitely gave me kind of rosy glasses as far as kids and having a lot of kids. Like, I was just like, they're a blessing, they're a blessing. And, you know, it, they were pretty great, especially as babies and toddlers. I love, I love being a dad. I love babies and toddlers. Now that I have several middle schoolers, it's less of a blessing. <laughs> Um, I've got like three teenagers and yeah. So the work is very different now, probably. Yeah. And I feel like I'm a little, you know, I can be more cynical now. (laughs) (laughs) I don't have to just consider them a blessing. I I have a question. Did your, um, like, did you ever try to explain Catholic sexual ethics to your wife? Oh yeah. And was she like, what the heck are you talking about? Like, like what? You know, I think she, she always wanted a big family too, and she was always on the conservative side of like reformed kind of stuff. So it was similar to her ideal anyway, because she wanted to homeschool and okay. Um, so there were weird things about like, okay, we can't do this too far because that would be a sin for me, but not for you. Those kind of things, like. And uh, happy to go into details if you want, but yeah, it would be, you know, just awkward things like, yeah. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, if you um, uh, if you want to say anything else about that, that's fine. But I have questions for you <laughs> pertaining to your leaving of the Catholic faith too. Yeah. And we should talk about, we should talk about some of the... Uh, some of the movements and stuff too. Like, are you familiar with the Regnum, Regnum Christi? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> I, I almost don't... joined that cult. Really? Yeah. Cause I was like searching for, I was searching for, um, just like, so when you're evangelical, everything is kind of voluntaristic. Um, all the people that, all the people that are there want to be there and are excited to be there. But when you're Catholic, a lot of it is cultural. And so you have to, if you want to be a part of a group that's really into it, you have to find the people that are um, volunteering for something or going the extra mile or joining some extra club. So one of the guys I met was a part of this. They called themselves Regnum Christi, even though I think the proper Latin is like Regnum, right? Yeah, Yeah. like Regnum, yeah. Like lasagna. But they said Regnum Christi. That's not how you would pronounce it. In Ecclesiastes right. to Latin, anyway. That's how they pronounce it. And they were part of the Legionaries of Christ. So they were the lay version of the Legionaries of Christ, okay. LC, okay. if you've ever heard of those priests. And their founder turned out to be a total total loser with a double life. His name was Maciel Marciel or something like that. And uh, so that scandal came out like while I was thinking about joining them. And so I went to this. Uh, and I think now they were mostly just about getting lots of money um because they would everyone that joined was like upper middle class and paying a lot of money to go to their conferences and whatnot and the the guy invited me and i was like i'll go but i can't afford it and uh so i guess they all pooled their money for me to come and then uh so i went to their retreat 
it was okay. Um, and then I like met with their priests and then the sales pitch really started. And I was like, doesn't your, isn't your founder like credibly accused of like abusing seminarians and stuff? And <laughs> they, they still tried to get me to join. And then it eventually became even more, more public. And I don't know what the status of them is anymore. I don't know if they're still legionaries or not. But uh, yeah, so almost joined that little I, weird Catholic cult. I Googled it and it looks like they like significantly changed in 2019. Um, yeah. So a Wikipedia says a greater, fuller, and more nuanced version of Rainium Christi emerged in that process, culminating in the 2019 statutes. So I guess they changed significantly um, yeah. in 2019. Um, I imagine that... I Quay asked about Knights of Columbus. I did not join them. I thought about it, but it was mostly really old retired guys. That that was my experience as well, but I often went to the Knights of Columbus because we would host events at their hall. What about the SSPX? Did you ever encounter the SSPX? Just online. Just online, um, okay. Not a lot. Uh, I remember I had one online friend that uh was very traditional and then i found out he was also very anti-semitic and believed a lot of conspiracy theories um yeah gloff is a is a knight of columbus but he hasn't been to a meeting in a while gloff i have a question for you and please don't be mad at me for asking this is it really all about selling insurance is that like the whole thing <laughs> that that's how it started right so I've heard that like people join the Knights of Columbus expecting it to be like actual Catholic outreach, and then they go to meetings and it's literally just about selling insurance, and they're all like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> um, my only experience with the Knights of Columbus is that my church would rent. There was a Knights of Columbus maybe ten minutes away or whatever from our church, and we would rent their hall to do events. So like we had an annual St. Patrick St. Joseph's Day party, and that was always at the Knights of Columbus. We we always had like there was other events that we would do it. My we so my family had like a surprise party for my grandparents' sixtieth wedding anniversary, and we had it at the Knights of Columbus. So like we rented out that hall like frequently, but nobody joined. <laughs> like nobody joined. We just <laughs> rented the hall because I think we just viewed it as like a like an old boys club kind of like yeah. That's where you go when if, you're an old guy to hang out and like smoke and drink a beer. Yeah, if it had been like a theology club or something. That's the, what I was looking for. You know, I wanted the other Catholic nerds, but I had trouble finding that like in person. I got all that online. Okay. And Gloff, um, Gloff says it's about fraternity technically, but mainly it's older retired guys who do volunteering. Okay. Yeah. I've heard from people and I'm sure that it like matters on where you go. Oh, and then he adds, but the insurance portion is big. So, okay. <laughs> all right. That's, I've heard that people are shocked by that. And Daniel says that's why he didn't join. Yeah. So, okay. My suspicions are mostly confirmed. Um, I remember really being interested in the permanent diaconate. And I was like trying to find out if my uh, dio diocese was ever going to do that or if they were interested in that. And that was also kind of like, oh, that's for older retired guys. Um, because I wanted to do it at like 35 or whatever. I thought eh, that'd be so cool. Um yeah. The the whole like diaconate thing is not a thing in trad culture. Like there's yeah, no... I know it's a newer yeah. Or... So like whenever people start talking about like deacons and stuff, I'm always like, I have yeah. no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> like no yeah. idea. Yeah, are you familiar with what it what the kind of the re revival of it was? Not really. I mean, I know that like, yeah. they they they'll read like readings during mass, right? That's kind of like all that I know. That that's everything I know about deacons. Yeah, I, I don't remember what communion. all they could do. I think they could, uh, they would do baptisms and readings during mass, and maybe visit the sick. I don't remember exactly, but um, yeah, I was interested in that. And then um, towards the end of my journey, um, there was a group, an Anglican church that fully converted over, and they became an Anglican use parish. And I heard about that, and I started going there. Um, and that was really cool. I don't know if you're familiar with their liturgy, but it was um, it was like even it didn't have very much Latin, but the English was like very high and very beautiful. Huh. Um, like King and James, it was really cool. or like was it like modern English? 
No, it was like high English. Huh. Interesting. Um, I don't remember if I could quote any of it, but um, I should have prepared. Anyway, no. oh, it was good. really you're beautiful. Good. It was very beautiful. We had uh, incense. We had like this acclaimed organist. Um, I would do the, I believe it's called cantering. If you sing the Psalms, is that cantering? My friend I think Jay I was would a know. cantor. Yeah. Is anyway, that, I forget some I feel, of the terms. I feel like that's like a very like kind of like Anglican type term. Yeah. Yeah. So it was Anglican Youth Parish. Um, it was beautiful. It was, it was my favorite of all the the liturgies that I participated in for sure. Um, and um, what are some of the other things that that caused me to question? Um, my oldest son was starting to go through um, confirmation classes, and he wasn't very interested, but I was, like, kind of pushing him. I remember that being just felt icky, <laughs> you know, to me. Just like, you got to go confess your sins to this guy. You got to gotta, gotta, gotta do it, bud. Um. Yeah. I wonder if my parents ever felt like that because like we we definitely like weren't into it. Like I don't know, I I, I kind of feel like raising kids in a religion is like just really tough. Because like how do you know mm -hmm. if your kids are actually into it or not, you know? <laughs> and I mean like they're yeah. clearly not when they're 10 because no 10-year-old is into that kind of thing. But then when your kid is 15, how do you know? Like and if they tell you that they're like not interested at all, like, do you force it? I mean, my parents did, and you know, I guess look how I turned out. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But yeah, um, but yeah, you know, I do wonder, and I also am very cognizant of the fact that literally all, and, okay, not literally, the overwhelming majority of Catholic YouTube is Catholic converts. You know what I mean? Yeah. Jimmy Aiken, convert. Trent Horn, convert. Uh, the one and only Kyle Whittington, convert. Uh, but Brian Holsworth, convert. Like literally, just go down the list and all of the big Catholic guys are converts. So it's like, you guys don't know what it's like to have Catholicism, like <laughs> kind of just pushed onto you as a child. And you're told like, this yeah. is correct. And this is true. And just, just trust the magisterium and it'll all work out. Yeah. You know? So I don't know. So and I, I was, yeah, I, that was a big part of it too. It's just like, I was so into the apologetic stuff. Um, and it started to feel to me like um, any other nerd culture. So you have like Star Wars versus Star Trek, right? And the nerds know all about, you know, all this fantasy that doesn't exist in real life, but it's really interesting to talk about and argue about, right? And uh, that's how I felt about Catholicism towards the end is like, Every time I talked about it with my Protestant friends or with Catholic people, I could I felt like I could defend any of the church's doctrine um, as good as any other layman. But I was just like, this is what the church teaches. And I could say what the church teaches. I could give the arguments for it. I could quote the scriptures that I remembered, you know, that supported it. Um, and by the end, I was like, OK, I can say what the church teaches, but do I actually believe it? And by the end, I just I was like, I don't think I believe it. I, I can, I'm interested in it as a subject matter, but I don't think gun to my head, I really would say I believed it anymore. And once I gave myself that opening, I was first of all, kind of scared because I was like, okay, what happens to my moral framework if I leave the church? Um, and, uh, can I even have a moral framework, you know, and, uh, is religion necessary for moral framework? Um, and I remember watching a debate between William Lane Craig and Shelley Kagan, who's a philosopher. They're both philosophers, I guess. Um, and Kagan is like an actual like moral philosopher. This is what he does is argue this stuff. And uh, after watching that debate, I was like, okay, he made some really good points. Uh, William Lane Craig is a theist um, apologist. And, um, oh, we should talk about Taylor Marshall too. Um and uh, just that debate just kind of like set me at ease. Like, okay, there's, I'm not going to change who I am just because I'm not Catholic anymore. Um, 
And once that happened and I realized that my faith was more about just kind of this assent to all these propositions, then it was almost radically easy. It was like, I can just stop assenting to it and I can just not go to mass today. And uh, I felt nauseous for about two hours and then I was okay. <laughs> and you're muted for me. I don't know if you're muted for everyone else. I was muted for everyone else. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> you put into words for me something that I haven't really been able to put into words, but I've, I think the moment that I felt okay to call myself not Catholic anymore was the day that I started thinking about Catholicism at like I would any other philosophical position. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like when I kind of realized like, um, okay, so maybe I'm a nominalist instead of a realist and that's okay. I was like, wait, well then can I just kind of be like an agnostic instead of a theist? And is that also okay? And like <laughs> at that moment it was something like, oh wait, like the world won't end if I just kind yeah. of like admit to myself that I don't believe something as strongly as I used to, or even my confidence has decreased to the point where I no longer can say that I believe it. And that's okay. Like I, the mm -hmm. world won't end. And I felt, I felt nauseous for a long time, but that's because of the way, the way that my story goes is that uh, I was uh, like, you know, getting strong armed into a marriage <laughs> and all that <laughs> stuff. So, so that was a pretty crappy couple of months, but, um, but uh, after that, I felt better shockingly quickly. I actually remember like laughing um, yeah. when I like got into my apartment a couple hundred miles, well, 700 or whatever miles away from where I used to live. And I just remember being like, wow, like I'm free. Like this is <laughs> weird. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I felt that too. That It's a weird feeling. And, you know, I, in some ways I was lucky because my wife hadn't become Catholic. My kids were not really that Catholic. My parents were still Protestant. Most of my friends were Protestant. Um, so I was always the oddball out to begin with. So not believing wasn't very difficult, like culturally for me. Um, you know, I knew Catholics locally and at different parishes and stuff like that. But the the Catholic culture is kind of, uh, it's not, uh, unless you're in a family that believes it, there's not a lot of strong ties. No one's like reaching out to me and saying, Hey, mm. didn't see you at mass. What are you up to? You know, um, there's, there's not a lot of that, at least not, not in my circles. So yeah, I mean, no I one guess, gave me grief about it. I mean, I, I got grief all right, but I, <laughs> I think that like me moving, also kind of softened the blow because like yeah. if people didn't know what was going on with me, they just knew that I moved and that's, and that's why they didn't see me anymore. So that's kind of like, you know, it kind of gave me a chance to start over, but did you want to talk about Taylor Marshall? <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> I remember, uh, so I was like, it, he was in a similar time of converting that I, that I was. And so I was like following his blog and, um, I'm sure we have like some emails exchanged and I listened to his podcast at the time. I remember when he got his doctorate um, and he was like a kind of conservative mainstream Catholic. Um, he and I were part of a part of a blog group. Um, I never really wrote for them. I was just kind of in the background because everyone else had like PhDs and stuff and they were all philosophers. Um, and I was just nobody with a bachelors in German, but, um, yeah. So they had like this pretty sophisticated reformed to Catholic blog, um, that he was a part of. And, uh, so, um, I never met him in person, but I definitely knew him online a lot. And then years later, after I left the church, I noticed how like popular he was getting and how fringe he was getting and i was like wow okay yeah i guess that does happen to a lot of people um that happened to like jerry Mattatix back in the day as well i think mm -hmm. you know he used to be kind of mainstream catholic answers guy the the trad rabbit hole it's real yeah yeah and by the time that taylor marshall was like crazy were you already out of the church because yeah i think so okay i think so yeah yeah just trying to do like math um, okay. Okay. And then I guess, um, I'm interested to know how you've been since then. So it's been a number of years mm -hmm. since you've been Catholic. Um, 
it, it can be tough. Um, mm-hmm. Hopefully yours wasn't super tough, but it, but it can be tough. How have you been? I guess where, where are you at now? Um, kind of mm-hmm. just in terms of like all of those different beliefs, like, um, and uh, it, yeah, yeah. To, how you been? I've been good. I think. Yeah, it's, it's fine. Um, I identify as an atheist, I guess, if we use a label, um, uh, I told myself, let's just start it at square one. And if evidence comes in for one thing or another, we'll go with it. But, uh, I just, uh, try to stick to the same values I always have. I was telling my teenage daughter the other day, it's like, you know, I'm I'm not a Christian. Your mom is. You're welcome to be a Christian. Um, but in some ways, I am a Christian. You know, uh, I live in a Christian country. Uh, my family is Christian. Uh, I know more about the Bible than I do about the Quran or any other holy book. Um, I generally, you know, I'm in a monogamous marriage. I uh, what other Christian things are that you know? I I try to think of others before I think of myself. I, uh, you know, the the general Christian ethic and cultural mores are still with me. So, in some ways, I'm I'm just as Christian as anyone else. I just don't believe the uh, the propositions. Um. So, yeah. yeah, that's where I'm at, and um, I don't I don't go to church anymore. My wife, she's free to now go to wherever she actually wants instead of following me to Catholic mass. Um, so I think she's happy, you know, relatively, um, she still hopes I'll eventually come back to Christianity, but I don't, I don't see that happening, but you never know. (laughs) Um, and did your wife wind up like, was she going to a Catholic church with you, but now she gets to go to like a, like a, a more Protestant church? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And she takes a couple kids with her and then a couple of our kids are, you know, non-believers, you know, the older ones are, um, one of them doesn't believe any, you know, it's kind of an atheist and the other one goes to church, but it's not sure. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, and I don't even have to say that much or even argue that much or even get involved just the fact that they know i don't believe and don't go to church gives them the freedom to explore on their own explore or think or not assume someone's terrible because they don't believe this you know it was like um and you know that's the hardest part probably is like the youngest kids are like you know worried about me or praying for me or stuff like that but you know i just try to be a good dad and hope it'll work out in the end but um i have a question for you about um being in a like interfaith marriage Mm -hmm. everything that i heard growing up was that like like don't do it it's a huge mistake it's going to be the end of the world and people will die and it'll be all your fault um (laughs) and and like you know then i grew up i guess and like now i know people of like interfaith marriages and they love each other and it works perfectly well um I guess as somebody who's been in a, like, you know, you know, a marriage where you're in the same faith and then in an interfaith marriage, um, what, what's your experience been like? Has, uh, were, were the fears as unfounded as I seem to think they are now? Yeah. Um, I think it totally depends on the people and how they express their faith. So my wife has always been like, she believed the propositions, but she wasn't the type of person that talked about it all the time or tried to get you to believe it. Or, you know, she wasn't evangelical about or proselytizing about it. Um, so she's kind of live and let live about it. She's, she's like, you know, if, if God wants to call you to himself, he will. And he, it's up to him if you're a Christian or not, you know, just kind of that kind of Calvinist kind of mindset. Um, and, if anyone, I, I'm the more like aggressive, try to convince other people of okay. my position. So, but, um, but I find that like, usually even bringing it up or trying to talk about it doesn't even work. So it's kind of just like, it's just like kind of one of those things we don't talk about that much. Okay. Um, uh, like I, and I, I'm up for, I'm up for any advice of like good ways to talk about it. But, you know, usually when I try to bring it up, 
she feels like she's being attacked or, um, or that I'm like, um, you know, peppering her, even just asking questions is just like, she doesn't want to be put on the spot or put on the stand or, you know? Yeah. 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 My, my wife is also, um, well, she's like agnostic, like I am. Um, but like in, in a way her agnosticism is like very different than mine because like maybe if, if mine is like an, like a principled agnosticism, I think hers is more of like a pragmatic agnosticism, uh, agnosticism, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, where she's just like frankly not very interested in any of these things, so like yeah. she she lets me complain to her about these things, yeah. but like if I bring up something specific, she can't like um, relate to it per se. Um, yeah, but she still lets me vent and all that, so we make it work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like half of my reading and interest is still either like biblical criticism or, um uh you know religious studies or new religious movements or cults and stuff like that like i love all that stuff you know if i went back to school i would totally get a degree in that stuff and so sometimes i'm i try i'm like hey honey what do you think about what do you think about the synoptic problem or what synoptic problem and she's like what what is that what problem and um uh, it's not a problem. It's just, you know, the a synoptic puzzle. gospels, they, they're they literary, you know, and the, they rely on each other and they copy each other. And she's, she's like, no, they were all eyewitnesses. And it's like, uh, not exactly. You know? Yeah. So that's as far as we get. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, the hardest part's the kids, you know, the younger kids. And my my position is like, you know, you married me as a Christian let's we'll go ahead and basically raise the kids as Christian. Um, but you know, they're going to be Christians with an unbelieving dad. And if they ask me what I believe, I'm going to say it. And, uh, I'm going to try to keep it lighthearted. I'm not going to try to change minds. I'm just gonna, um, you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm also like a cynical joking person. So I, I tend to like, you know, mock religion and stuff. I try not to do it too much around the kids, but, I do it a little bit. I catch myself making jokes that like in hindsight were not charitable whatsoever. And so I, I try, yeah. to, I'm not perfect, but I try not to do that, but I'm not perfect. And it, it happens to me too. Sometimes. I mean, I blame, I, I like blame demons for everything. I do. Yes. Like, yeah. Well, it... I'll do the Satan voice. You know, <laughs> I do that to my kids a lot just to show them it's not real. That's really funny. <laughs> <laughs> Look, kids, there's nothing to be afraid of. Yeah. Uh, um, how do you feel about doing like a little bit of Q and A? Yeah, let's do it. Um, so, Mister Computational Theist didn't listen to the stream. <laughs> That's fine. But he was looking I for wouldn't. he was looking for a <laughs> summary of your like uh, why you mm. deconverted. If I may, I'm going to say evolution of living beings, like including humans, evolution yeah. of church doctrine, and then also, I guess, just a um, a realization that it's okay to change your position on like first order philosophical propositions, kind of. Um, <laughs> that was my yeah, key takeaway anyway. Good. Yeah. Um, yeah, just kind of like um, seeing the seeing the man behind the curtain, um, the mix of, uh, you know, Pope Francis, and then also uh, several scandals, uh, which I didn't talk about all of them, but um, there's the Father John Carapi, this guy I really looked up to. He turned out to be a total fraud, the founder of uh, uh, Legionaries of Christ. He was a total fraud. Uh, my local bishop, um, he, I think he had to resign or something, um, basically for, um, I, I don't want to say exactly, but um, he had to, because I don't know the exact details anymore, but basically, you know, he there was a priest that was credibly accused and he didn't handle it right. Um, and that was Bishop Finn in Kansas City. So if people want to look up his scandal, they're welcome to. And I remember like, at the time, 
I, I was still totally believing, but he had his scandal blow up. And I remember a lot of the conservative Catholics at my parish were like supporting him no matter what and defending him. And I just thought it was not good. And, uh, yeah, that happens when there's like a cult of personality around a priest or yeah. like, uh, I've, I've seen cults of personality form around priests and yeah, it was around the bishop even. Uh, yeah. yeah. And that's even worse. Yeah. 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 Jeez. So, um, a little bit of that. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that, I think that sums it up. So, um, I, I came to Catholicism for the authority and for the beauty and the magisterium. Um, and then I left Catholicism when I realized that, you know, those were, or I felt like those were man-made as well, or evolved just like anything else. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, next question is addressed <laughs> to Jill. I don't know who Jill is, but I think it's an interesting question for maybe both of us to answer. What do we think is the best argument? So neither of us actively believe in God, but what do we think the best argument for God's existence is? For me, I think that my answer kind of depends on what mood I'm in. Um, I happen to think that like the Kalam works. Like I'm happy to admit that there's a, a like a, a first cause. Mm. My my argument isn't with the Kalam. It's with you know turning the first cause into God. That that that's actually where my problems begin. Um, so I like that one. Um, but also I've just been recently like thinking a lot about um, uh, Pascal. I've been reading Pascal's mm. Pensies. And his very pragmatic approach to it kind of speaks to like my little engineering heart because engineers are pragmatists. And I think Pascal was a pragmatist. And when you read his pensies, I think that really comes through. So you get two answers from me, but that's because it changes with my mood. My favorite, I believe, was the transcendental. Okay. Um, which is that the one where uh, why is there anything instead of nothing? I don't know. That's that was always my go to in my brain that kept me theist. Why is there anything instead of nothing? I now think, you know, that may not even be a good question. Just it's kind of just like a weird logic puzzle. Um, <laughs> so it's not doesn't have a lot of force for me anymore. But that kept me in a long time. Yeah. Um, and the moral argument kept me in a long time. Uh, when I was uh, when I was evangelical, I really liked C.S. Lewis. I read Mere Christianity probably half a dozen times. Um, anytime I would start to doubt my faith, I would read that or read other apologetics. Um, and that that probably kept me in uh, the last couple years of Catholicism because I was worried about losing my moral framework. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's kind of scary to to think that you might lose your moral framework. So I get it. <laughs> Um, yeah. This isn't a question. This is just a crazy thing. So uh, Grand Mufti Tarkin says, and this is talking to me. I just found your channel last week um, and thought this channel was cool right up my alley. Interest wise, yesterday I realized that I was in your honors cohort at NJIT. That's where I went to college. We were, it looks like we were both in the honors college. The honors college and my cohort specifically was like less than 200 people. So this is like a like a very small group of people that we're talking about here. That's super weird, and it's a really small world. So that wasn't a question. I just wanted to point it out because it's really weird and a small world. Someone but mentioned Brideshead Revisited in the chat. I loved all those Catholic novels, Evelyn Waugh, um, Silence by, by uh, Shasuku Endo. Um, great stuff. Cool. Um, the Uncharted Catholic Man podcast would like to ask... Um, do you think that Catholicism puts you on the path to atheism slash would you still be a theist if you had remained <laughs> Protestant? That's a good question. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how to answer that. Um, I, th I don't know. It's really hard to know yourself. And yeah. it's, it's even harder to know yourself in like a counterfactual sense. Like, yeah. It, like it primed me in a way because it, did such a good job of kind of demolishing some pillars of Protestantism, just like, you know, demolishing kind of sola scriptura and sola fide. Like I really felt like the Catholic arguments were better on those two, two counts. And, um, so I was, uh, I was ready to throw myself on the, the bark of Peter to rescue my faith. That's cool. Um, <laughs> 
does Craig view Faith as primarily prob- again? I think this. I think William this is Chad Craig? or William Lane Craig. Oh, maybe. <laughs> I can't answer for him. I believe he. I don't think he would say it's propositional. Yeah. I don't uh, think so. Do I lo- view Faith as propositional? Uh, pff, man, I don't know. Um. I think it it can encompass anything, but um, I mean, for me, it's it's an essential part of faith. Like, uh, if you're saying the creed because you think because you're just a part of a community and you want to be part of a community, that's that's fine. But that doesn't work for me. I have to actually believe it. So I have to believe the propositions. I agree. Uh, and this next question uh, here: if it's just about community, I'd rather go do something else. I'd rather play board games or play guitar um i'm gonna read this question then i'm gonna cough uh what was the ratio of say propositional truth to you chris on your conversion journey uh hmm. the eucharist definitely played a part i definitely talked about it in my testimony somewhere out there there's even like a radio recording of me giving my catholic testimony i think i have an mp3 of it somewhere really int- that's kind of <laughs> cool <laughs> yeah I, I had to like call into a radio show at like six in the morning and talk to some guy that was super energetic (laughs) and you know me i'm just like kind of chill yeah (laughs) yeah um but uh i i loved the eucharist i loved going to mass um i often had like emotional experiences around around mass and the eucharist um for a while, I worked at a hospital that had a chapel with daily mass, so I could just like hop downstairs and go to daily mass. Um, I was very, I really, I really um, identified with the sacrifice of Christ. Um, the Passion was like one of my favorite movies. I would like full on ugly cry through the entire movie. I watched, I watched it many times. I had the DVD. I watched all the commentaries. Um, <laughs> can I tell yeah, you? Like, a, I was, uh, I just, uh, I really, I really felt it. So, I like to think that I feel things deeply. I've cried at plenty of movies. Mm-hmm. I did not cry at The Passion. Oh wow! And I remember like thinking that something was wrong with me because, oh. like, I don't know. So The Passion, like, it moved me, but I may have been just like so. I may have been more disturbed than sad, if that makes sense, um, because of how violent it was. Like, um, and I don't, I don't, I'm trying to, you know, psychologize myself from, yeah. you know, that movie's like, what, 20 years old almost, 15 mm-hmm. at least. Um, so who knows what I was really feeling at the time. But I remember just thinking, like, what's wrong with me? I should be crying and I'm not. Why? Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's how I felt. Um, we answered this one already. What is the best argument for God's existence? Um, what about this one? Uh, did your Christian friends get more interested in this stuff when you did? Have they learned some biblical criticism to win you back or anything like that? No. <laughs> um, they were more interested in the c- Catholic stuff, mm. um, discussing it and arguing it. Uh they're less interested in atheist arguments or non-belief. I, I, I think that takes a special person in a special place to even kind of entertain some of those conversations. Um, it's just, it's so off the charts. <laughs> um, it's just hard for people to even talk about a lot. Uh, you know, I, out of all my friends, I probably have one that I could, you know, talk about biblical criticism or and and he's catholic now too um so he's like my one friend that converted kind of after me and with me um and he is he's much more like he's kind of a liberal catholic now and okay um i don't want to speak for him like i think he believes the the core propositions of it but um he's not you know like nfp and stuff like that he's like eh, i don't know it's probably got it wrong 
<laughs> hey, good yeah. for him if he's able to kind of like uh, separate things like that. Um, and yeah, and he can talk biblical criticism with me and it doesn't affect his faith at all. So that's good. I, I think that I've found that like there's probably like roughly an equal number of people who play like Magic the Gathering versus who are into like biblical criticism and all this stuff. Yes. Yes. Um, like you wouldn't like if, if you love or, or I said Magic the Gathering or we could do Star Trek. Like if you yeah. were a huge Trekkie and you just like walked up to a random person, and you tried to talk, they would be like, please stop. Like, yeah. I'm not interested yeah. in this topic. And the same Lord thing of the five. Rings was always my thing. So I was a huge, huge Tolkien nerd. OK. Um, yeah. I was at a and concert. I have a Tolkien. Yeah. You want to hear a quick, a hilarious Tolkien story? So yeah. I was at a concert for like I'm into like some weird bluegrass stuff because I live in Kentucky. Um, mm-hmm. But I was at this cool like folk band um, called Top House on mm-hmm. Sunday, and the band walked onto the stage to the Lord of the Rings theme, like the duh 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 duh, duh which I thought was weird but cool. Um, and then in the middle of their set. They, they stopped playing. They said, this is the part of the set where somebody yells out a random number. And they just held out the microphone. And somebody yelled out, like, 73 or something. And he goes, great. He pulls out a copy of The Hobbit. He goes to page 73. And he just reads the entire page. And then they played The Hobbit theme from The Lord of the Rings. Um, wow. And then after that song, he spent, like, 10 minutes explaining, like, um, the, the lore from the first and the second age. <laughs> It was hilarious, and like everybody was so confused, and I was cracking up. Like I was having a blast. I thought it was hilarious. Um, That's so, awesome. Yeah. Apparently, we're not the only big Lord of the Rings fans out there. But. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I sometimes even summed up my my Catholic journey with Lord of the Rings. Like I became Catholic because Tolkien was Catholic, and then I felt like uh, I became atheist because I like Lord of the Rings better than Catholicism. Huh. Like. <laughs> so I became Catholic in order to get that same kind of beauty and feeling that I got from Lord of the Rings. And then I realized Lord of the Rings is a pretty great story and uh, maybe a better story than Christianity. Um, so I say the same thing about a lot of fiction. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm a huge reader. And I think that most some fantasy books back there. I do have some fantasy books back here. Um, is that Wheel of Time? Yep. Yep. I'm, mm-hmm. a, I'm a pretty big Wheel of Time fan. Um, but you know what got me into Wheel of Time was the fact that so I'm a massive Brandon Sanderson fan. And after I oh, finished okay. reading everything that Brandon Sanderson wrote and I knew that he finished the Wheel of Time, I was like, I guess that means I have to read the first 11 books. And then I did. And I loved them. Um, and I, I happened to think that Brandon Sanderson did a great job finishing the series. So anyway, I won't bore the listeners. Um, I'm doing Joe Abercrombie right now. I'm halfway through his work. Uh, so I just read um, the his first trilogy. <laughs> um, yeah, the, me too. Uh, the, so the, the first the, law, yeah, yeah, um, last argument of kings and the before they are hanged and the blade itself, yeah, I didn't go in order, but yeah, I literally just read those. I finished. You too. The, oh wow, <laughs> that's, that's super weird. That's a weird coincidence. Um, and I want to read. I'm on read... the first standalone right now. I okay. just I'm halfway through Best Served Cold. Okay, I have not started Best Served Cold, <laughs> but that's because I actually restarted the Stormlight Archive because Stormlight Archive Five comes out uh, later okay. this year. So I've only read one ba- Brandon Sanderson. I just read Mistborn. I thought it was okay. So okay. I, uh, I, we'll see. I love Mistborn. I also read it at a particular time in my life where like I really needed yeah. a good book. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think that I like I view Mistborn through like rose colored glasses, you know, <laughs> um, but I love it and I'm not going to apologize about it. <laughs> um, but no one, someone wants to know if your concern is more about Christianity or about mm. theism per se. My concern, uh, I you know I I don't know. Well, I don't know what what is it, what do they mean by concern? Um, they said problem. They said is your problem uh, theism problem? specific to the Christian conception? I like I I don't really have a problem with any of it. Um, so, I just don't believe it. Um, <laughs> yeah yeah um you know uh for me i think uh you know christianity has makes a lot of really bold claims without a lot of evidence um so i don't believe those propositions um and then theism in general i just um i don't feel the presence of god in any way besides my own emotions that i ginned up 
relative to the story. Um, so uh, if he wants to show up in some in some way that he did in in the Old Testament, First uh, Kings eighteen, I believe uh, the prophet Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal. And uh, Yahweh came down and started a fire on some wet logs. That would be cool. Let's do. Let's set up some more of those tests. That's what Pine Creek Doug always says, right? With like the I'm a big Pine stuff. Creek yeah. Doug fan. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Cool. Um, Rosemary has an interesting question. Um, she would love to hear your thoughts on whether you think coming from a Protestant background made you more likely to find evolution as a challenge to faith, even after becoming Catholic. Hmm. Yeah, see, I didn't it, see at the time. I did not see it as a challenge to faith. I've, um, so I don't think it necessarily makes a difference. And plenty of people accept evolution and maintain their faith. Um, for me, it was just like not evol evolution per se, or the science of evolution is just like being able to accept how things are um, and stating the facts as they are without this kind of overarching story. And, um, um, yeah. So yeah, basically, you know, it's, it's, it, you can, you can, you can box it in all different kinds of ways and you can accept evolution and accept that Jesus walked on water. That's fine. Or, you know, or uh, for me, it was just like, it was one door that opened to um, investigating how things began. So, and that includes um, the evolution of humans and includes the evolution of the church. Cool. So, yeah. Next one's for me, and I can answer this one quick. Have I read Phaser? Yeah, I've read a decent amount of Phaser. Um, so I, I've read, um, what's his like introduction to Aquinas or whatever? Um, I read that yeah. one. Um, I read, uh, um, oh shoot. Let me pull I up read here. one of his and I read his blog back in the day. Actually. Yeah. I read, I read Phaser's blog. Um, let me pull up the list of books that Phaser has written. And I think I read the last superstition. Yeah. Okay. Yes. That That's one? his new atheism one. Yeah. He, and he's a new atheist in that one. Oh my gosh. Like the first chapter of the last superstition is like could have been written by the Catholic Richard Dawkins. Like, <laughs> sorry, I don't, I don't like Phaser like hardly at all. I, I'm not a fan. I, I've read a decent amount of not all, obviously. Aquinas, a beginner's guide, the last superstition. Uh, I have not read his philosophy of mind. I didn't realize that he wrote a book on Locke. Neo Scholastic essays, Scholastic metaphysics, five proofs. So I've read um, less than half of his stuff, but did but, you read uh, David Bentley Hart's uh, experience that, of God? No, no, I've never read any Hart. Um, but Phaser was big in like trad calf world, even though I don't mm -hmm. think Phaser himself is a trad. I don't think, um, but we just loved scholasticism and Phaser is, you know, Mr. Scholastic. So that's why I was like, I've, I've been familiar with Phaser for a long time. Um, but um, I want to see how many more questions we have. I think we're getting towards the end, which is good because I've I've been keeping you here for a long time. Um, oh, it's fun. Uh, so this is going to be like a two-parter. So it looks like, can Chad go into more detail as to how the contingency argument, why there is something rather than nothing, no longer makes oh, sense? No. It could be phrased <laughs> as why anything exists at all instead of nothing that doesn't need to exist existing I don't, at all. I doubt I can go into more detail. I'm not a philosopher and I don't pretend to be one. Um, hmm. Yeah, I don't know. That is totally fine. <laughs> um, I'm doing a final, um, a final look through to see if there was any questions that I missed. I don't think I did. Um, up oh, here's one final one. So your name is Shad, and my name is Devin. That's fantastic. <laughs> Um, that's got to be on purpose. That, that's one hundred percent on purpose. Um, <laughs> would you think a god that created an auto, an automaton and has been taking a less hands on approach to it makes more sense than a god that has a more hands on approach? So, does the deistic um, god make more sense than the theistic god? And I want to say yes, 
because I could almost see somebody thinking like, well, there are actually four gods and those gods would be gravity, <laughs> uh, electromagnetism, the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force. Like in some mm. way, those are just four very hands off gods. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like sure. those are the basic fundamental forces at work in the universe. So like, in a lot of ways, that's how people talk about God. So maybe there are four deistic gods, and maybe that's what's really true. Now, obviously, that's not what most people have in mind when they say God. But if the question is, like, do you find that version of God to be more, like, does it make more sense to you? The answer is yes. That version of God makes more sense to me than the hands-on version. Hmm. And what do you think? Uh I don't have any thoughts about that. Okay. It's interesting, but yeah. Um, you know, I, the reason why I brought up that Experience of God book by David Bentley Hart is I feel like he almost makes that argument as kind of a almost a deist thing and everything, all the stories we tell ourselves about the Old Testament God and the New Testament God and Jesus. And he almost seems to say, like, that's just kind of man's reaching you know huh. and it's not i don't i don't know if that's his exact argument but it, for me it was like if that's the best you can do i'm not really interested um so if it's just some impersonal impersonal being controlling everything then i'm not really interested I 100% agree, and I also don't think that religion would be the right tool to um, explore the deistic kind of God. Like, the deistic yeah. kind of God would be discovered by physics, you know? Like, that's kind of how yeah. I see it. Um, so, whether or not there is a deistic God out there, I don't think that, like, holy texts are where we would go to find the answers, you know what I mean? That's kind of my... <laughs> yeah. Anyway. That's just my two cents. Chad, I've kept you it's on. It's not very philosophical. Is this your normal, uh, yeah. normal audience? Yeah, I've, I have a lot of because uh, you know I'll do you know I'll, I'll I, I'm I'm a very lay 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 philosopher, so I will uh, make you know videos about nominalism and make all of the uh, you know oh, all okay, the realists gotcha. very mad at me because you you know those Thomists they're very uh, uh, passionate <laughs> about nominalism being false. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, uh, I have, uh, links in the description down below, but I would like to ask you where we can find you and then yeah. also just go ahead and, and add any kind of closing thoughts that you want to in there. Sure. Um, I think, uh, Catholicism is beautiful. I'm thankful for my time that I spent in it. Um, I, I learned a lot of really useless knowledge, um, <laughs> but it was fun. And um, uh, I don't, I don't really miss it. I can say that I, I do miss some of the music. I miss singing in the choir. That was a lot of fun um, because we had a really good choir and we sang in parts and um but um, otherwise, I don't miss it too much. Um, I'm free to, uh, I feel like I'm more free to look at things as they are um, in a realist sense. Um, and uh, I can enjoy Catholicism as much as I, as I would when I was Catholic, when I believed it. Uh, I can still enjoy learning about the minutia of Pope, what's his name, back in the 14th century. Um, I just don't have to believe that he was infallible. Um, and I, and I don't have to believe that the Bible is inerrant or the Bible is infallible. I can learn how it evolved. Um, I can learn about, uh, how morality evolved and how different, um, changes happened in the church. And, um, I think it's, um, I think, when you're in the faith, you're worried that you're going to miss something if you don't have it. And I don't feel like I'm missing anything. Um, so if you're worried about that, don't be too worried. Um, and feel free to reach out to me. I am on Twitter, Chad, Tony, T O N E Y one word, Chad, Tony. Um, that's where I post my, uh, 
jokes about Catholicism and Christianity and theism. Um, so try not to get too offended, I guess. Uh, um, <laughs> and I have a, uh, I do have a YouTube channel called Lost Theologies. I've posted like three videos. Um, I, so I talked about my journey on one of the videos. Um, and I did another one called, uh, another one I'm call- proud of called uh, Maximal Facts. Have you heard of the minimal facts argument for the oh, resurrection? Gary yeah. Habermas, of course, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I had... I I enjoy like learning about Mormonism and other like religious movements and stuff. And um, so I was hearing all this stuff about Joseph Smith and um, I realized that we had, you know, obviously we know a lot more historically about Joseph Smith or about David Koresh or whatever. We know like their background, where they were born, what they were interested in, how their ideas developed, what people said about them, what their enemies said about them, what their friends said about them, what their former friends said about them. You know, we have all these diaries and all these stuff. And you compare that to what we know about the Apostle Paul or about Jesus or about Peter. We know hardly anything about these people. And so I jokingly made a video called The Maximal Facts where I look at like, Okay, so Peter claims he saw the risen Jesus, and then that's the minimal fact, right? And then I introduce maximal facts, and I just make them up. But but I take them from, like, real-world scenarios of people that claim to have visions, you know? And so, okay, Peter said he saw the risen Jesus. Well, what if Peter was 85, and he was in and out of sleep all day, and uh, that's when he claimed he saw the risen Jesus? Is, yeah. is it still a great fact? You know, is it still a great testimony? Uh, we don't know what these people were like. Uh, we don't know if they were reliable. It's shocking. They could have been the weird, crazy uncle yeah. um, that always claims to be seeing things. And uh, that was the guy that started it, you know? Yeah, it's shocking how little we know from the first century, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I love talking about that kind of stuff. Awesome. Well, if you want to hear more from the man himself, the link in the description down below to the YouTube channel apparently is broken, but I'll fix it as soon as we're done here. Um, And then the link to uh, your Twitter is also down below. Um, So go, go give Chad a subscribe and a follow on Twitter. Is that what you do on Twitter? Right. I'm not on Twitter. I think you follow. Oh, I got called a boomer. I'm an elder millennial. (laughs) <laughs> I don't even see where somebody called you a boomer. I, I'm probably more of a boomer than you in terms of, uh, in, uh, Oh, I, I see it from, from Gloff. Gloff, you and me and Chad are not that far apart in age. So if, if, you know, if Chad's a boomer, then bad news, Gloff, me and you aren't far behind. So gentlemen, this has been a lot of fun. Chad, Thank you so much for sharing your story and getting to uh, and, you know, uh, giving me the opportunity to kind of, you know, you were able to put into words some things from your kind of, I guess, falling away from Catholicism that I wasn't able to put into words. So I got a lot out of this. I know that the audience got a lot out of this, too. Um, Thanks so much for coming on. And yeah, thanks for having me until next time.